dear students in the image based questions we are going to see the module number 2 that is acute abdomen before going to the case scenarios i want to define what is what is what is the meaning of acute abdomen any severe pain abdomen which is lasting for more than 6 hours not relieved by any masses and majority of them need surgical intervention is called acute abdomen i told majority of them so some of the patients may not need any surgical intervention for example in case of acute pancreatitis usually we won't do surgery unless it is complicated the various causes for acute abdomen are infection or inflammation obstruction of the bowel both small and large bowel ischemia ischemia of the bowel perforation of the bowel intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal hemorrhage and extra abdominal medical causes like inferior wall mi and lower lobe pneumonia also can produce severe abdominal pain mimicking acute abdomen and you should be able to differentiate these medical causes from the real surgical causes so now this is case number 1 A 50-year-old man underwent emergency surgery for severe epigastric pain. He was having this epigastric pain on and off for the past five years, and now very severe pain in epigastric region for the past few hours with tenderness all over the abdomen and rigidity. So this is the case scenario. These are the three pictures, and these are the five questions. Okay. So question number one: What pathology can be seen in picture A? and what surgery is being performed in picture b c with this case scenario and see this is a laparotomy okay after opening the abdomen you are seeing a hole there in the first part of the duodenum so it is a case of duodenal ulcer perforation that is what you are seeing here and this is liver <coughs> so in this picture you are seeing they have put the omentum over this perforation and they have closed it this is nothing but the grahams omentopexy that is the surgery for the rasco grahams omentopexy surgery for the duodenal perforation why they are not suturing just over the i mean the perforation and why they are putting this omentum that you must know because this area is already inflamed so if you are going to take bias directly this area the the suture will cut through and it won't stay there And that is why we are putting this momentum to prevent this cut through. Okay, that is the reason. What physical signs would the patient have presented with? So they have already mentioned in the case scenario that this patient is having tenderness all over the abdomen and bowel-like rigidity. But apart from this, what other sign this patient will have? Okay, so if you arcus the abdomen, okay, because of presence of lot of air here. in this area okay you will get obliteration of the liver tunnels if you auscultate okay there won't be any bowel sounds at all and this is called silent abdomen these are the two signs you will get in this case how can we confirm the need for emergency surgery the moment you are having somebody with rigidity of the abdomen you have to order uh, erect chest x ray or erect abdominal x ray where you have to look for evidence of any pneumo peritoneum or free gas in the diaphragm if you are seeing this okay that is an indication for immediate exploratory laparotomy that is what you have to do in this uh, case what further procedure need to be carried out uh, during surgery so you you are doing this grahams omentopexy but because of this perforation there will be lot of spillover in the peritoneal cavity so apart from doing this graham somentopexy you should also clean the peritoneal cavity thoroughly with 3 to 4 liters of either saline or that is normal saline or ringer selectate and this is known as peritoneal toileting what post op management should be considered okay after one week okay you are discharging the patient uh, and then asking the patient uh, and you have removed the sutures also you are asking the patient to come back Uh, after uh, one week so patient is coming back at that time okay what else you have to do so what you have to do you have to start a 
H. pylori eradication treatment and you have to do an apogee endoscope also to find out the status of this ulcer, whether it is healed or not, okay, you have to do. So, these are the answers for these five questions. You can read, all of you can go through because after my lecture, they are going to give this PowerPoint or the PDF of these files to you. So, please read all these answers also and I have mentioned from where I took this uh, question. It's there in the Bailey. If you want to read more about this problem, okay, you go to page number 1125 in 27th edition of Bailey where you can read about duodenal subperfusion. Case number 2. 28 year old female present with two day history of vague periumbilical pain. Today the patient has lower abdominal pain, right more than the left, which is associated with new onset of urinary frequency. She also vomited twice. She is sexually active and her menstrual cycle tends to be irregular. Her last menstrual period is six weeks ago, that is two weeks already late. On examination, right lower quadrant tenderness is there, guarding and rebound is also there. The pelvic examination is without any cervical motion, tenderness. Vital sign, temperature is okay, 100.2, 100 heart rate 90, BP is 110, 68, lab hemoglobin 12, hematocrit 36.3, WBC 11,300, urine analysis 5 RBC and 10, uh, 15 WBCs. Okay, and you are having these three pictures. What is your diagnosis? With this, it is acute right lower quadrant pain. So, you have to think of the first, the commonest cause is, of course, acute appendicitis. Okay, this picture also, okay, it is showing the appendix. So, this is acute appendicitis. But, what are the differential diagnosis in a female patient? Because already this patient is having uh, missed period two weeks late already. So, you should rule out ectopic pregnancy. And the urine analysis is showing 5 RBC and 15 WBC. So, you have to rule out UTI also. Apart from these two causes, what are the other uh, differential diagnoses? You have to rule out twisted ovarian cysts that is very common in the second decade or PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, where there will be cervical motion tenderness in pervaginal examination that is absent here in this patient or you have to suspect endometriosis if the pain is more during only during the menstrual period okay and another if patient is having pain in the mid ovulation mid period uh, on 14th day then you have to suspect what is called exaggerated ovulation or metal smuts this you have to suspect in a female patient these are the different uh, causes for acute right lower quadrant pain. What are the surgeries performed in figure 1 and figure 2? See, this is an open appendicectomy. You are seeing the appendix here and this is the meso appendix. These are the branches of the appendicular artery. This is a laparoscopic appendicectomy. And what investigation you are seeing here? This is a longitudinal view. This is a cross-sectional view. So, here you are seeing a tubular structure. So, to make a diagnosis of acute appendicitis, you should be able to see a tubular structure of more than 6 millimeter, which is not compressible. That is the three criteria you have to look in a ultrasound of the abdomen. If all these three criteria are there, then we are dealing with a case of acute appendicitis. Okay? This is very important. How to uh, find out the compressibility? Because normal appendix is like a rubber tube. Whereas, if it becomes inflamed, it becomes a rigid tube. So, it is no more compressible. So, you have to use your ultrasound transducer probe and you have to compress the abdomen and see whether this uh, tubular structure is compressible or not. If it is not getting compressed, that means it is acute appendicitis. Okay. What are the post-op complications? Okay. What are the post-op complications? This is surgical site infection intraperitoneal residual abscess if you are not doing a good peritoneal toileting okay your patient will go for residual intraperitoneal abscess fecal fistula if the ligature which you are going to put at the base of the appendix slips then these patients will go for fecal fistula 
and post op adhesive obstruction also can happen even from one week to up to even after 10 years it can develop pili phlebitis is rare nowadays because we are using very uh, high broad spectrum antibiotics nowadays this complication is not that common nowadays so case number 3 a 40 year old obese woman has right upper quadrant pain for many months but reluctant to consider any surgery she now has an episode of constant pain for 18 hours which she says is worst ever she is febrile and also having vomiting few times okay what is your diagnosis so this patient is having number 1 right upper quadrant pain okay pain is more than 18 hours okay and patient is having febrile also and this is the ultrasound so what is this what is your diagnosis a case of acute polycystitis and uh, uh, how will you differentiate this from biliary colic okay usually if it is biliary colic the pain will be uh, not more than 3 hours yeah 18 hours means it cannot be biliary colic and you, you are getting inflammatory markers like patient is febrile yeah usually biliary colic patient won't be febrile okay these are the two things and ultrasound wise okay you are seeing the stone this is the gallstone and you are seeing the posterior acoustic shadow there is thickness of the gallbladder wall more than 4 mm and you are also seeing pericholecystic fluid collection okay if it is a biliary colic you won't see the gallbladder wall thickness and the the pericholecystic fluid collection you will see the gallstone and the posterior acoustic shadow but there won't be any thickness of the gallbladder wall or the pericholecystic fluid collection okay what is this investigation if you uh, are doing ultrasound if you are not not seeing any uh, i mean the uh, gallstone but you are seeing only the thickness of the gallbladder wall then it is what is called a calculus cholecystitis is where you must do this investigation this is called hida scan or this is also known as isotope scan so where you have to give hida <coughs> hipiron amino diacetic acid that you have to give the drug will be excreted by the uh, liver you are over oh, liver you can see and then it will get excrete, uh, excreted through the extra hepatic biliary tract it will go to the duodenum and then to the small bowel in a normal patient usually part of this uh, hida, hida will go into the uh, gall bladder suppose if the cystic duct is blocked this cannot go into the gall bladder so it is a case of if if the gall bladder is not opacified that means it is a case of acute cholecystitis here in this picture okay the gall bladder is distended but apart from that you are seeing patchy gangrenous areas here so this is a case of empyema of the gall bladder impending perforation here so you have to do only what is called because sometimes you no know, doing a uh, cholecystectomy will be dangerous so in these type of cases if you are suspecting either empyema or a gangrenous gall bladder you have to do what is called cholecystostomy you have to put a catheter inside you have to drain the infected bile that's all you have to do don't uh, go for uh, major surgery like cholecystectomy what are the investigation shown in figure i i think i have discussed all these things what is the treatment in this patient <coughs> if it is acute cholecystitis the patient comes to you within uh, see within uh, 72 hours then you have to do um, immediately either open or lap cholecystectomy if patient is going to come to you after 72 hours you can do what is called uh, elective cholecystectomy after 45 days that's what you need not do immediately surgery immediately you can treat the patient with antibiotics and anti inflammatory to cool down the patient cool down means to treat the inflammation and the infection what are the post op complication in this surgery so we are supposed to do cholecystectomy so in cholecystectomy okay bile leak is the dangerous complication there will be hemorrhage also because of injury to the cystic artery but you can manage it easily but if there is a bile leak and if it is minimal you can put a pigtail catheter and it will be all right if it is leak from the cystic duct due to slippage of the clip then you should do ercp 
and put a stent into the CBD. That is the treatment for cystic duct leak. If it is CBD injury and bile leak, it is a dangerous complication and patient may need major surgery like cholidaco jejunostomy and hepatico jejunostomy. Coming to case number four, a 60 year old woman present with two day history of abdominal distension, pain, profuse bilious vomiting and constipation. There is history of previous laparotomy for duodenal perforation. See, they have given two day history of number one, abdominal distension, abdominal pain, bilious vomiting and constipation or obstipation. So this is what is called quartet, four symptoms which there is history of previous laparotomy also. So with this immediately, okay, you, you have to suspect with this quartet of symptoms, you have to suspect small bowel obstruction, you have to order abdominal x-ray erect. Yeah, both are abdominal x-ray. Probably this is a erect phlegm and this is a supine phlegm. You are seeing what are the causes for this pathology. You have to think of intraluminal, uh, mural and extramural. Okay, before uh, discussing the causes of this pathology, okay, I will discuss about the findings in this x-ray and this x-ray. So, you are seeing multiple air fluid levels here. See, this is the air. Below there is fluid collection and that is why you are seeing the straight line here like a step ladder. In this picture, okay, you are seeing dilated small bubble loops with valvule conimentis or plica subclaris. These white lines, no, these are nothing but the mucosal folds in the small bubble. That is what you are seeing here. This is called uh, valvule conimentis or plica subclaris. Okay, and uh, there won't be, if it is a complete obstruction, you cannot see any gas shadow in the large bubble. So, be, because it is centrally situated, this is small bubble loop. So, in abdominal x-ray, you have to look for multiple air fluid levels, number one. Number two, dilated small bubble loops more than three centimeters. And then the presence of plica circularis or valvule conimentis. And there is, if it is a complete obstruction, there won't be any gas shadow in the large bubble anywhere. Okay. And what is this picture? This is a uh, laparoscopic picture. Okay. You are seeing intra-op and you are seeing the addition. This is momentum. It has gone and adhered to the scar there. This is inside. This is the parietal peritoneum. So, the scar is not only outside the abdomen. You can see inside also. So, this uh, momentum has gone and stuck to this inside scar. Not only the momentum, even the bubble has gone and stuck there. If you are having a finding like this, you have to do a procedure called adhesiolysis. How to do it? You can use cautery here near the momentum, no problem. You can just cut the momentum with cautery and you can release it. But while you are releasing this bubble from this addition, you have to be very careful if you are going to use cautery because if you are going to use cautery over this bubble, if you touch this one, no, this will get perforated. So you have to be very careful if you are going to use cautery to relieve this one, adhesiolysis. What you are seeing, I think I have I have discussed all these things. Now I have to discuss about what are the various causes. Intraluminal causes are gallstone ileus, which I will be discussing in some other, uh, I mean, case scenario. Trichobazar, that is uh, uh, hair ball <coughs> uh, bolus obstruction, hair ball bolus obstruction, and phytobazar. If it is instead of hair uh, ball bolus, if it is because of vegetable matter, it is called phytobazar. Mural causes, it could be benign stricture due to TB or Crohn's or it could be malignant strictures due to non hodgkins lymphoma. The extramural causes are post-op adhesive obstruction. This is the commonest cause for small bubble obstruction or obstructed inguinal hernia, congenital bands like vitellointestinal bands, valvulus and intussusception. These are the various causes. And what is the treatment for this particular case? Because we know only the patient is having small bubble obstruction, that's all. You cannot, I mean, find out unless you are going to open the abdomen, you, you may not be knowing the cause for the small bubble obstruction. So you have to write the answer as exploratory laparotomy because 
we are going to find out the cause only after doing the uh, laparotomy. So your answer should be exploratory laparotomy and treat the underlying cause. Whatever may be the cause. If it is a, a gallstone ileus, you have to treat the gallstone ileus. If it is a, a stricture, you have to treat that stricture. So according to the cause, you have to treat. So your answer should be exploratory laparotomy and we should treat the underlying cause. That's all you have to write. Okay, coming to the case number five. This is a 80 year old male patient present with severe abdominal distension. See, enormous abdominal distension and no bowel movement or gas per rectum for three days. As well as he is having a recent onset of vomiting. He has Parkinson disease and chronic constipation and lives already is living in a nursing home. His medications include levodopa and benztropin, which he has been taking for several years. His abdomen is severely distended, enormously distended. He does not have any abdominal surgical scars. No scar there. So we are excluding the post-op adhesive obstruction. He is, but his abdomen is tympanetic, but <coughs> has no significant tenderness to palpation. There are no palpable hernias and rectal examination demonstrate absence of stool with no palpable mass or stricture. These are the two pictures. What is your diagnosis? See, this is classical. What you are seeing here is a plain abdominal x-ray with, this is the coffee bean appearance. So, what is your diagnosis? It is a case of sigmoid volvulus. What are the different? Here you are seeing the x-ray. Here you are seeing a actual, the intro op picture. The moment you are opening the abdomen, see, this will pop out. This, uh, this looks like a tire. So, it is called tire-like abdomen. Okay? This is enormous distension. So, what are the different causes for this pathology? See, this picture is there in the Bailey and Lau. So, it is the narrow attachment of the pelvic mesocolon, long pelvic mesocolon, loaded pelvic colon because of high fiber diet and addition at the summit of this loop. This can cause, okay, twisting of this part of the bowel. It will go for valvulus. So, these are the different causes. And the, I, the other things I have discussed already. The coffee bean appearance is also known as bent inner tube sign, omega sign and Freeman doll sign. So, if the, uh, and there is an another important question. Okay, I will I'll just, how will you clinically differentiate the, whether the underlying bowel is viable or non-viable? So, this is very important. If the underlying bowel is viable, Abdomen is only distended. There won't be any tenderness. If the underlying bowel is non-viable, then there will be generalized abdominal tenderness and rebound tenderness. If the underlying bowel is gangrenous with perforation, apart from generalized tenderness and rebound tenderness, patient also will have board-like rigidity. So, merely by doing this physical examination, Without doing any sophisticated investigation, you should be able to tell whether the underlying bubble is viable or already has gone for gangrene. So, what is the treatment? If it is a mild case, that is, the bubble is still viable, okay, and patient is a young patient, you can do a rigid sigmoidoscopy, you can uh, untwist the bubble and decompress the proximal bubble. That is the treatment. If the bubble is viable, Normally, you have to do sigmoidectomy with primary anastomosis because bowel is viable. We are not doing a emergency surgery. It's an elective surgery. <laughs> then you can do sigmoidectomy because the bowel is preferred. Nowadays, we are not doing sigmoidopexy. Suppose if the bowel is already non-viable and we are doing emergency surgery, exploration, then you can do the sigmoidectomy but shouldn't do primary anastomosis. Instead, you must do only Hartman's procedure. That means the proximal colostomy, the distal colon, you have to close and keep it inside in the peritoneal cavity. So, the case number six. So, 41-year-old woman present to the emergency department complaining severe and continuous epigastric pain for the past 24 hours. The pain radiates straight to her back. This is very important. Whenever they are giving a clinical scenarios, 
you have to read each and every word is very important this it is pain radiating straight to the back is the clue to the diagnosis she has had progressive nausea with vomiting the vomitus is bile stained without blood her abdomen is not distended bowel sounds are hypoactive she has marked tenderness to palpation in her epigastrium without guarding or rebound so what is your diagnosis with this clinical picture severe epigastric pain and pain radiating straight to the back and with this ct scan you are seeing pancreas dilated it is acute pancreatitis so what is what are the causes for this pathology there is a mnemonic known as i get smash so you have to know this one idiopathic it could be gallstone it should be ethanol trauma steroids could be mumps it could be autoimmune cause scorpion bite hyperlipidemia ercp or drug drugs like asatioprine and valproic acid so you should know all these things yeah and uh, abdominal exam you can do where you can see these two signs you can see it this is cullen sign and this is great and a sign suppose you are seeing a ecchymosis in the inguinal region that is called fox sign you are seeing ecchymosis in the scrotum uh, then it is called brian sign brian sign the cct yeah it is showing hypoechoic area here see this is the hypoechoic area the all other area is getting the dye i mean it is taking up the dye so the, the what we used to call is the pancreas is not getting light up this area only the other area is getting light up light up means it is taking up the dye only this area is not taking up the dye it is hypo echoic and this is because of the necrosis of the pancreas if it is a necrosis that is an indication for surgical intervention you should do laparotomy and you have to do necrosectomy and then continuous irrigation of the abdominal cavity especially the lesser sac okay that is the thing okay there are different scoring system to know the severity of the acute pancreatitis okay that is called ransens glasgow imri balthasar apache 2 and bisap among all these scoring system bisap is the best because immediately you can assess the severity of these cases all cases should be admitted in icu this is regarding the treatment because all acute pancreatitis case you should admit in icu at least for 24 to 48 hours indications for surgical intervention are and you have to treat them conservatively only you have to give mainly you have to give painkillers opioid analgesic you should give because patient will be having very severe pain you have to give opioid analgesics okay <coughs> what is the indication for surgical intervention if you are having necros pancreas okay you have to do laparotomy do pancreatic necrosectomy with continuous peritoneal lavage if it is pancreatic abscess if it is, uh, uh, also you have to do surgery if you are unable to arrive any definitive diagnosis then also you have to do exploratory laparotomy coming to case number 7 say 85 year old man present to the hospital with a sudden onset of severe abdominal pain the pain is poorly localized and involves whole of the abdomen on examination he is distressed and is also having atrial fibrillation it's very important pain is out of proportion to the physical findings generalized tenderness is there rebound tenderness both are positive but there is no rigidity okay no rigidity means the bowel is still probably is not going for perforation but generalized tenderness and rebound tenderness means it could be already gangrenous atrial fibrillation they are telling and pain is out of proportion to the physical finding so all this clinical scenario is showing only mesenteric ischemia yeah that is a diagnosis acute mesenteric ischemia <laughs> what is the etiopathogenesis and type of the various type of this acute mesenteric ischemia could be because of acute mesenteric embolus that is 40% of the cases 30% of the cases is because of acute mesenteric thrombosis the embolus is usually because of from the heart you see this is a case of atrial fibrillation so this could be a case of 
<coughs> mesenteric embolus. The thrombosis is because of uh, arteriosclerosis and it could be even mesenteric venous thrombosis like your DVT. Yeah, the incidence is only 15%. Sometimes it could be even non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. That means there is no occlusion of the mesenteric artery but reduced blood flow through this one. And there is another thing is chronic mesenteric ischemia. This is characterized by intestinal angina. Okay, it is a slow occlusion, not an acute mesenteric ischemia. Okay, in figure one, <coughs> you, we are seeing CECT of the abdomen, showing dilated small bowel with, okay, I will show you the picture, yeah. Here, you are seeing dilated small bowel with thickened bowel wall. So that means, it is already ischemic bubble wall. That is why it is bubble wall is thickened. And what is this investigation? This is this is a DSA of mesenteric angiogram. Okay, but it is a DSA, digital subtraction angiogram. Here you are seeing this side, left side you are seeing a lot of branches, but right side, especially here, maybe the uh, maybe the right colic artery after uh, sorry, not right colic the superior mesenteric artery after uh, taking origin from the iota okay it is blocked somewhere there so could be it is a case of embolus has gone and blocked if it is a thrombus usually the uh, superior mesenteric artery will be blocked at the origin itself not after uh, i mean the branching so this could be a case of embolus there in the thing and in this picture you are seeing because of the, the blood supply is cut off okay what will happen? The small bubble has already gone for the color change. The large bubble is okay. The color is normal, pink color. But you see, even small bubble, part of the small bubble is normal. Only <coughs> part of the small bubble you are seeing the color change. Okay, right. These are the investigation. What finding? Yeah. This I have I, shown you already. The figure 3 is showing gangrenous bubble. And what is the treatment? That is what I am showing the answer here for acute mesenteric embolus. We have to do embolectomy with Fogarty embolectomy because it's an acute one. Like the peripheral uh, arterial disease, we have to do Fogarty embolectomy, do revascularization, and then if there is gangrenous bowel, you have to resect them. Acute mesenteric thrombosis, then there is no role of uh, embolectomy. You have to do what is called catheter directed thrombolysis. And then you have to resect if there are any, I mean, gangrenous bowel. If it is mesenteric venous thrombosis, then you have to give only anticoagulation with heparin and then you have to resect any gangrenous bowel. If it is a NOMI, there is no obstruction, no, then you have to give papaverin, the vasodilator, and you have to give antiplatelet drugs. If it is chronic mesenteric ischemia, there it's, you can do what is called thrombectomy angioplasty that is percutaneous transluminal angioplasty and you can also do bypass surgery like the peripheral arterial disease.